and welcome to Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga. And for this week's episode, we are thrilled to be joined by Professor Emeritus Donald Smith from the Department of History at the University of Calgary, as we will explore his new book, Seen But Not Seen, Perspectives of Indigenous People and the Marginalization of Indigenous Culture in Canadian History. Uh, joining us this week on Ask a Historian is uh, one of the favorite people that I have crossed paths with over my time at Heritage Mississauga. Always gracious with his time, his, his knowledge, and uh, frankly, uh, Professor Smith, your enthusiasm. Uh, and uh, this is uh, Donald, uh, uh, Donald Smith, Professor Donald Smith, Professor Emeritus of History from the University of Calgary, uh, but uh, a, a, a former resident of Oakville with long ties to Mississauga and history in Mississauga, particularly Indigenous history with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Um, uh, Professor Smith, uh, thank you for, for joining, with, joining us here. Uh, and uh, uh, hoping Calgary is keeping you well. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're warm welcome. Um, you, you've had uh, long ties with uh, local history and, and Indigenous Mississauga history, and uh, uh, you have a new book that's come out, but first I want to touch on uh, your previous books, and, and probably... Um, I, I have them here. I have the old copy here. I don't have the new the new copy, but uh, uh, Sacred Feather is the story of Reverend Peter Jones, um, which uh, honestly, I, I think I've said this to you before, but uh, I've read this book at least three times, um, and I always feel like I'm visiting the story of an old friend. Uh, I, I commend you for the book. Uh, I, I commend you for the story. I know this is this has been around for a long time, but uh, I, I recommend anyone interested in the story of the Mississaugas and their connection to what is now the city of Mississauga, this book should be on everyone's reading list. Uh, uh, I, I commend you for that. And I know it's been around for, for quite some time. Uh, and then you, more recently, you produced Mississauga Portraits. Um, wondering if you can, I mean, I mean there, there was a, a, a gap of time between the two books, um, but I know that your own scholarly research never abated uh, <laughs> during that time. Um, how did you get involved in the story of, of, sorry, of the research around Indigenous Mississaugas and their connections to to this place and, and, and their story? How did that start for you? Well, it started a long time ago, over half a century ago, and it's really, uh, I was interested in Indigenous history already by that point. We're talking say, 1969, 1970. And I started my doctor at the University of Toronto. And I'm not saying I discovered them because heavens are always there. But I came across, got aware of, became aware of these wonderful papers at Victoria College, Victoria University and the University of Toronto is the proper title, but yeah. Victoria College is what we call it. Uh, they were in their library. They had fantastic papers from uh, about Kaki Wakonabi or Sacred Feathers, um, uh, Reverend Peter Jones. He was both a Mississauga chief as well as a Methodist or United Church minister. And his the uh, sources were wonderful. And this is so rare in Indigenous history to have this backup. Now, it's their cultures are oral. So obviously, that's where you go. But for an outsider like myself, who interested in Indigenous history, the documentary base was essential. And so that's that just, I couldn't believe it, the richness. And I did my best, Matthew, I did, for both books. I tried to add to that, that body of literature. And I, I went to England, uh, States, and um, even a visit to Paris, the National Library, there was an, an item there. And I couldn't expand it much more, like maybe 25% more information. But the lodestone was at in Toronto, right there, waiting for me. Can't ask for anything better. And I tried to, I, I did two winters of Ojibwe, um, the, the um, language of the Ojibwe or Anishinaabeg, and um, didn't get that far. But at least I got an understanding, a bit of a feel. Um, but this job, um, all my research notes, by the way, were saved. And they're now at Victoria College in the library or at Trent University, two spots. And I welcome uh, others to come. This is a rich, rich source. And um, I'm an non-Indigenous person. I'm, um, <laughs> well, what do we say, ancient? <laughs> it, it, it needs new eyes. <laughs> Someone, it is all open, especially for Indigenous folks. To, if they got, if they got an inkling of the language, and if they got the culture, they could take this one and turn it around. I mean, history is a constant 
reinterpretation. And, and please, nothing is set in stone. Heavens no. That's the excitement of it. So um, I discovered this uh, 50 years ago. I found that the Mississaugas uh, were extremely receptive. And I first went there, well, 50 years ago. And they good friends there. And it just was a wonderful working relationship. And so I've had a wonderful time at it. And now I'm at the stage of life where I can look back, reflect, and I was blessed. Well, and, and I think that's, uh, you know, I, I often use the term that a mark of a good historian is that you invite other historians to explore and follow in your footsteps. Uh, and, and uh, you know, you, you may perhaps no finer example than yourself. Uh, you know, I, I talk about, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants and, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you might peer a little bit, but, uh, you know, the, the foundation is there and, and you provided that foundation. And, and uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm astounded by the scholarly research and the depth of your knowledge and the depth of your findings are, are, are quite incredible. But, you know, that that's uh, the reason for our, our talk today is, is kind of the, I guess, is, is it really, is it, is it a bad taste to say the next chapter of, of, of the work? But uh, uh, very recently, uh, seen by Let's call it a postscript. A postscript. <laughs> I, I, postscript. I, 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 I know you keep saying you don't have another book, but I still think there might be another one. I don't know. <laughs> be a Zoom presentation. <laughs> there we go. There we go. So seen but not seen. Um, uh, this was, uh, I mean, you touch on, this couldn't have been more timely perhaps in, in the way that our society is starting to, um, I guess, contemplate its own, own, its own history in terms of our dealings with marginalized people um, and how we have uh, connected to uh, shaped uh, the dark and the lightness of, of our history, the, the, uh, the residential school systems and reconciliation. And again, the story of marginalized people, particularly from the indigenous perspective. Uh, and and your, the way you have explored it through, I guess, the movers and shakers of their eras and how they influenced policy towards indigenous people. Uh, it really offers a sense of I guess Canadian identity self exploration is that is that a way to a fair way to express it? I'm wondering how you came up, how this book evolved for you. How how did this book come about? Well, to go back to the beginning, it begins on the banks of Lake Ontario, the North Shore of Lake Ontario, my hometown, Oakville, Ontario. Because Matthew, this is incredible. Anybody in your audience who's under, well, I don't know, under thirty won't believe this. But I grew up without knowing anything about Indigenous people. I didn't even know whose territory it was. I, I had no idea. I went right through. This was our land. This is unbelievable. I know. It, it, I, I just sort of shudder to say this, but it's true. This was our land, and we were the like anything goes. I mean, it wasn't any concern about First Nations or Indigenous people or whatnot. It just carry on. There wasn't a great mention in the the Mississauga themselves. Mississauga, incidentally, are part of a much larger, it's a, Mississauga is a term for Anishinaabeg in this, on the North Shore of Lake Ontario. And um, the, 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 obviously the credit people are, are they're central in this and up the Rice Lake, Peterborough area as well. But that this is a specific group, but they're part of something much larger, Anishinaabeg or Ojibwe is another term that's used. I didn't hear anything about them at all. Honest to goodness, it was remarkable. So I'm now moving along and getting up to about age 20 and um, two experiences. Uh, first was at university, a conference on Indigenous Canada. It was very early. It was a conference, um, just remarkable actually for this time. I was an undergraduate and I think second year and I went to the conference and it, it really picked my interest. And here I was growing up in Canada and not knowing a thing about this. And um, it was very well organized. They brought in uh, indigenous indigenous people led the study groups and all. And um, it was a good component. There weren't many indigenous students then at university, but number of those that were were attending the conference. There was, there was about 200 people. It was at the University of Toronto, Trinity College, and uh, that started it. So that's the beginning, and that's 1966. Now, that next summer, I worked on a railway gang. It was with something called Frontier College. It was a, a very idealistic uh, effort, and uh, what you did was you uh, 
worked during the day, and then at night you taught English and arithmetic and whatnot to the. It was a, a railway gang. Where did and you then, work? Where was it? I was in Manitoba, and, okay. got, and very. I mean, honestly, I got off the train at night and um, Berrigan, Saskatchewan. Uh, you know, I just. I stumbled around and found the bunkhouse. <laughs> there I was going. I was right, right off the bat. The next day I was with a pick and shovel. <laughs> and then teaching at night. But teaching was it was pretty casual. But it didn't matter because this was a life experience that you couldn't buy. The gang was uh, predominantly First Nation at the beginning. There were Cree and Soto or Ojibwe is the Soto is a word they use in Manitoba for Ojibwe or Anishinaabe. Um, so the First Nations people, and it really was extraordinary. Here I am, I don't have no background whatsoever in Indigenous topics and all, and here I am working in, in this uh, with, with Indigenous people. And I, it, it was a different culture. These The, the fellows were from northern Manitoba. And La Paw and Gillam up in the Hudson's Bay line. These are pretty isolated places. And they did, they had English, yes, but it wasn't their, by any means their first language. And they had a different culture. And it was such an eye opener. And I started, started to think, gosh, wow, this is incredible. My own country and all these people I don't know anything about. <laughs> so that, that was it. Now that's 66. Now we have to go a little bit further because my passion in, in at this period was Quebec, was French English relations. That was the, that was the theme. In fact, that is just as pulsating and important as Aboriginal issues or Indigenous issues are today. It was all over the place and all. So my, my interest was Quebec. And I worked at Expo uh, 67 in Montreal. Really? Uh, I, I had some French from school, but that didn't add up to speaking it. I learned to speak it. I have a heavy accent, but I, I learned to get into it and uh, really enjoyed it so much that now we're up to 1958, the year after Expo. I graduated. I wanted to do a history, a master's in history, and I wanted to keep my French going. So I decided I would go to Laval, in the city. And I had it was sufficient um, French was I had sufficient French to do it, um, and big secret never put this on the air before. I was able to do my thesis in English. I did my seminars in French, of course, and my, uh, but I had to. Do, I was able to do. They're very generous. I was able to do my thesis, my MA thesis in English. If I hadn't had that right, I'd probably still be there because <laughs> written French is torturously difficult. Spoken is not a big deal because well, anyways. It, written so rigorous uh, and so in any case I, I got my MA and but when I went oh I should have added this when I went to Laval of course I wanted to study in French and all that's good but I was going to do Africa uh, because that Africa was always something in high school that really interested me I read a lot about it and unfortunately though their specialist in Africa was on sabbatical so what am I going to do um, my thesis advisor was a wonderful man Pierre Savard and Pierre actually was part Huron. It's incredible. But he's French Canadian in culture. And he didn't ever claim to be an expert on indigenous issues, although he had his grandmother was a Huron. Didn't that wasn't that was just sort of an added detail. The fact was he was, was French Canadian in culture. And anyways, he said, I can't um, I was suggesting perhaps going back to sixty six, thinking of the railway gang, thinking of the conference, maybe well, I'll stay in Canada and I'll do Canadian history and I'll do uh, some topic of indigenous with indigenous people. And uh, my selection was, and here we go, Matthew. This is fifty years ago, and I that book that seen but not seen. It's the same. It's, it's the same thing. I'm I'm the, I'm the kind of guy that sticks with a topic. I'm like a dog with a bone. I don't let it go. It was images of indigenous people in the in 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 early Quebec, how they were perceived. I mean, listen, this is the, my chapter actually. My chapter on Jacques Rousseau, uh, chapter seven. It's pretty well. The base, the foot and foundations of that are in my MA thesis. So I, I had this Pierre Savard, wonderful man, and he uh, directed me from the indigenous side to a, a gentleman called Jacques Rousseau, who was a botanist and an historian at Laval, and I had a private seminar with him. And he had been across on Gaba, or northern Quebec, in a canoe and snowshoes, the whole works. He was one of the last of these legendary characters. And um, gosh, I had a private seminar with him. So they, he, I was on the hook. That winter, 68, 69, there was no other place I was going to go. Indigenous history. That was it. And um, I got, so uh, next next chapter was University of Toronto. And uh, that's when we began with this interview. I found, I, I found some, you know, great, <laughs> great discovery. They've always been there. <laughs> I mean, at least for 50 years they had. I, I came across these papers 
by a gentleman. It's so funny. My detractors, Matthew, I must share, share this with you. My last name, of course, is Smith. And the study I followed, I, I, the, the subject I chose was on Jones. And so my detractors say that my, my thesis of my work is Smith on Jones. <laughs> But his, his, his English name, he's, of course, and um, his native name was Taki Wakanabe or, or Sacred Feathers. And uh, this was terrific. So I discovered that in the doctoral program. And um, uh, I'm very blessed. I, I had uh, James Carolus as my thesis advisor, and he was open to it. Otherwise, the native hit indigenous history, you've got to be kidding. It wasn't a field. It wasn't, there wasn't enough there to do it. I mean, but Morris Carey said, yes, I think this is good. Uh, st a study of Sacred Feathers or Peter Jones and, and uh, the Mississauga experience and um, go for it. But I said, I, I can't really help you, be, but I have a good friend uh, uh, on the Ontario Historic Sites Board, Ed Rogers. He was the ethnologist at the Royal Ontario Museum. And uh, Ed, 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 Ed was the one. He, he just got me all set up and told me all, all the, the protocols and etiquettes and all. And, and I always keep up with, he said, well, you got to keep up with the community. And probably the most you ever can do is three. <laughs> you know, you've got to, get, with new credit, in my case, it really, my community, the one I was visiting and were close to touch with, because they were so receptive and it was such a mutually beneficial relationship from my vantage point, um, it was the Mississaugas of the credit. But I also had contact with Tomogamy up north, um, north of North Bay. And uh, out west, of course, I've had, um, I guess, primarily we contact with, we with the Stonies in the foothills and um, wonderful experiences. So in short, I was hooked and I did my PhD and um, that that was, um, I I must say it was arduous, um, but because I met the people and it was meaningful and it wasn't this abstraction, I, I got through. And um, well, um, it, 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 I, I really owe, I owe uh, Morris Careless. I mean, he was my, like he was protecting me sort of thing. And then <laughs> Ed Rogers was giving me the food. And then the First Nations, I took a course, native, uh, Fred Wheatley. Fred Wheatley, I took a Ojibwe course in the Native uh, Friendship Center. And Fred was a great influence on me. And Basil Johnson became very, very well known after Basil. I took his, his course one winter too. So I had great background. And then of course, here I am, an expert on um, expert quotation marks, you know, white man expert um, <laughs> on the Mississauga in the 19th century. So where do I get a job? In Calgary, Calgary, Alberta, <laughs> complete switcheroo. <laughs> so I'm out on the plains. And uh, uh, then I, I, my career was there, 35 years, wonderful 35 years. And gradually I got transformed. And um, But I never lost that interest in the Mississauga because they, well, I mean, it was just so except so friendly, and also um, I had a lot of material because I'd started my thesis. Of course, I had all this research material, and um, I felt yes, maybe the best way to package it was a biography of of my central character, uh, Sacred Feathers or Peter Jones. So that was um, not as easy as it looks. You know, you can't just take a thesis. I mean, it's not a oh, well, <laughs> it's a research document. Okay, so I got to got to retool it, and um, it took me uh, wow. I this is seventy five, and my book came out in eighty seven. Twelve years. Well, and, you're uh, working and raising a family at the same time, so you had other commitments. Yeah, was, uh, teaching stuff, but nonetheless, it was great. And um, Heritage Mississauga was really fabulous. I mean, great backup, and and <laughs> when the book came out, great backup indeed. I mean, honestly, you guys are just the same, like new credit. I've got, like, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm a team player. <laughs> I, I'm not going in alone. <laughs> you can say, honestly, I, you get, you organized a, a number of talks over the years. And, uh, well, just to sort of short, sort this up a bit. Uh, so the book comes out in 87. It was fantastic. Fred Wheatley gave the prayer in Ojibwe at the Native Friendship Center. It was a highlight. Oh, it's terrific. Wonderful, wonderful memory. And I, I spoke at First United in Port Credit. That was where Peter Jones had a connection. It was terrific. So that's book one. Okay, now I'm working on other topics, right? Uh, by this point, I'm, you, you know, I'm, I'm not, I can't just do it. <laughs> Alberta, <I'm> Mississauga, <laughs> that's not going to sell. I, I, I slip shifted into Western history and, well, not totally, but I was Canadian historian, but I did a trilogy 
Matthew. It's a trilogy, three biographies of um, colorful characters who all were in Western Canada at one point. And the, the first one was um, Chief Buffalo John Longlance, and then there was Grey Owl, and um, then then uh, Honoré Jackson, uh, sorry, Riel's secretary in, in 1885. I'm sorry, we don't need to do that detail on that one, but simply uh, other projects. But there was something, I guess in the West, we'd say a burr under my saddle. And that was, there's something left with this Mississauga project. And the fact that um, I just kept out the relationship with the Mississauga and uh, Lloyd King was living, Margaret Salt was the researcher. And the three of us, we'd have a merry time getting the research office at New Credit and just have a, have a hee -haw. Uh, Lloyd, incidentally, was, um, uh, he was a great elder even then, and uh, the school's named after him. So I had, again, it, I got this connection and I knew there's something more to it. So uh, I, there had been some things said about Peter Jones, my book, uh, Sacred Feathers. Perhaps I was too uncritical. And um, that's the danger of biography because you do, I, you know, <laughs> you said, I love that line. It, like Peter Jones was like, Sacred Feathers reading the book was like, getting to know an old friend again. Well, that's the way it was with me. He was an old friend. And so that's dangerous a bit. So I thought, and, and still there was enough material. And of course, this is how historians work. You know, you got the material, you're going to use it, right? <laughs> Otherwise, what's the point? What did I, what did I do? <laughs> not to leave anything in the cupboard. So um, I looked at this and, um, well, there's, there's many biographies. There's other bio people I can bring in. And at the same time, by doing so, I'll put Peter Jones in more of a perspective because these will be other vantage points and not all were like, come on, this is what uh, sort of, uh, to be honest with you, upsets me a bit. They're, they're, they're all different visions. History is like looking at a mountain and you know the different vantage points to look at that mountain and describe it. Well, that, that sure, Peter Jones, I, 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 I'm very much attached to it, but absolutely. Um, however, there are other vantage points. So in my book, Mississauga Portraits, which took form, um, I guess, well, it wasn't immediate after Sacred Feathers, but a couple of years after, it started to come together. And I, I, uh, University of Toronto Press was interested, so I did. I began to prepare it, took the donkey's year. Donkey's years. I mean, honestly, they, <laughs> I think my contract was like five years earlier than the book. But anyways, it got done and it ends up being, it ended up being um, Peter Jones plus seven other portraits and it's called Mississauga Portraits. And this way I'm able to um, tell a lot more. That's it there. And that, that, that um, I, the first chapter though is Peter Jones and his very, very good friend, Edgerton Ryerson. They were, they were, I, I, I used that analogy, blood brothers. They were so close the the non-indigenous fellow and the first nations man. They were good buddies. And uh, anyways, that, that's sort of the beginning. And uh, that, that's very important to me, that first chapter. But the other seven are on these other individuals. The others, Mississauga, my, my favorite. Uh, I shouldn't say that. You never say that of anything. But my, the, there's two others that are from the credit that uh, I'm very attached to. One is Nani Baniqwe or Nani. She's a fantastically courageous First Nations woman who uh, actually takes land claims and gets an audience with Queen Victoria. So she's a favorite, she's a ch chapter. And then the second one that I'm very much attached to is a real colorful guy, Mongwa Das. And he was uh, related to Peter Jones, but he did not, he did not like, Peter Jones was a United Church, uh, well, Methodist or today's United Church. And he was quite strict and, and um, uh, Mango Dust didn't like this too much. He felt that the credit mission was becoming a boot camp. <laughs> and he just, he just broke off. And he actually, short form, he started to, had a Wild West show and, and went to Britain and, and France and Belgium. So he's a rebel and he's a great story. And he comes back to North America, tours around for a while. And um, I'm very attached to him. So what I'm saying is I'm not, I'm, I'm not out there. I don't have a message. I don't come in here with some kind of, great I, message of how life should be or whatever. I, I try to understand these people in the context of their times. And that that's the challenge because you have to learn a lot more than about these characters. You have to know the whole ambiance of the age. And um, I enjoyed very much doing that. I finished that 2013 and now we can get on to the, but this scene but not seen doesn't come in, 19, in 2014, doesn't at all. The year after you start writing it, yes, but the ideas are going back fifty years. I was going to say you you you've actually painted the the the, uh, 
the the rope with the knots on it that are connecting the stories where this is another chapter this is again put in in my in my interpretation of of what you've said and, and what i've read of the book so far um you're putting the life and times of those people that you dealt with in in sacred feathers and in in miss saga portraits but now looking at them again through that other vantage point of of seen but not seen yes because it's seen but not seen as my youth you see because i i i I've, 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 I've been some contact with those people but i didn't I didn't recognize it as i just didn't see it so um that's the cover by the way, is extremely appropriate. And I must share this with you because here's the big poop I, you know, I'm supposed to be the big, <laughs> I'm supposed to be the big expert, right? Yep. I knew that was the moment to choose for the cover. It's the presentation of the red paper in Ottawa, 1970. Right. And the red paper is the response to the white paper, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, number one, Pierre, Pierre Trudeau, um, and Minister of Indian Affairs, Jean Chrétien, introduced this white paper, which is to end Indian, uh, to, well, status Indians are to be eliminated. There's no longer going to be a Department of Indian Affairs. There's the indigenous people called first, well, Indians then, now First Nations, will be put into the mainland society. Their special status will end. This is announced in 1969. There's an uproar. In 1970, the First Nations, that's Walter Dieter in the center, he's presenting the red paper to the prime minister and, and John Chrétien, the minister of Indian affairs. That is a dramatic moment. I knew that was the way, I, that, that had to be the cover, had to be the cover. And the young man who's so instrumental is Her Harold Cardinal. And he's just off that picture on the cover, but he's there. He's gonna get up at after this little exchange, after they presented the thing, and he's gonna give just absolutely eloquent speech. He's only 24 years old, unbelievable. Excuse me, Dorian always has to try and be correct, 25. <laughs> um, so anyways he oh no maybe 24 but he's almost 25 anyways doesn't matter harold cardinal he just is outstanding in his his talk uh, very very eloquent and he wrote his book his just book had just come out unjust society so that's the moment the dramatic moment and the first nations say no and we're still the, the turnaround is still going on there's not going to be they, first nations want to remain and they they're not disappearing. They're not going away. Yeah. So that, that basically, that's the that's the the cover is the pivot. And then I go into these uh, fifteen lives, starting with our prime minister, first prime minister John A. Macdonald, and there I try to be. I try to be, a, see him in the context of his times. I'm not out. I don't have a present agenda. I'm not. I try. We all. We don't. I, none of us escape. But I'm trying very much to see him in the eyes of his period and to understand him not to condemn him that's the point it's to understand not to condemn or to praise it's to get a feel for the age and and why things happened like they did and mind you when two generations away or three generations away when we're interpreted <laughs> we'll get the it was just it's inevitable they're going to see us in a different way and, and but i'm trying to see people in the context of their times and the enemy is what's called presentism and that is I'm not saying that we, even I can't escape it because we're living in the present. So therefore there's a certain, a very definite influence on us, but try to escape it. That's all. And so I do, um, the chaps, uh, the, I, sorry, I was short on women. I mean, I will be the problem again is written records. Right. And until really 1970s or so, the, the, you just don't have that much material. But I did have several very powerful women in, involved, and um, they're they're included, uh, and, and I also have indigenous people as well. It's about uh, yes, I should make that quite clear. This is a study of non-indigenous Canadians' views of First Nations, and it's a collective biography. It's a, it might be said to be a sequential biography because generally I try to follow a timeline, a chronology. And we start with our first prime minister, and then we go into a prominent missionary, uh, John McDougall, and then into a very prominent academic, George Grant, who was Grant Hall at Queens, is named after him. He was principal at Queens, very ad advanced views. Um, and then four, a judge, five, Duncan Campbell Scott. He was a really the most well-known uh, deputy minister of Indian affairs 
early 20th century. Six is, um, we're getting now into um, Ontario, Paul Wallace, his name was, and Paul Wallace wrote an outstanding book about the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois, one of a breakthrough book in 1946. Right. He's next. Then a uh, Quebec chapter, I mentioned, Jacques Rousseau, a BC chapter, yeah, that was tough. BC was a week. I was weak on BC. So I spent about three times as much time on BC. If there's any of your listeners who are from BC, just give me some gold stars, folks. I did my best. <laughs> and uh, they're the, 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 some very colorful people. Um, and finally, Quebec, um, then, no, sorry, uh, Alberta, chapter nine. And of course, that's the home team. So I, I, I gave it my best. Um, finally, but here's the important part. Um, epilogue. That means, uh, that's the summing up. And um, I, I, I take the book, the I don't want your listeners to be misinformed. The, the emphasis of the book is from 1840s to the 1960s. And then from the 1970s to the present, that is the last half century. It is more of a timeline. I, I, I had no choice there. I mean, I, if I, I had tried to do the same approach to the last half half century, I would be working on this to the year one uh, till I was 150, because the literature now is exploded. Up to the 1960s, it is manageable. After that, it is not. Look at literature, all, all that whole just a simple literature field, and look at the prizes that are being won by authors and stuff. The indigenous people have just they just taken off, and it's in, in other fields as well. It's just phenomenal. So I couldn't do that. So it's a timeline. And um, it works. It really does. I was trying to do too much. I tried to do it in a more comprehensive way, and it just was. Uh, I didn't have the background. I didn't have the skill. And and um, anyways, what I do is is done according to the way I can do it, which is it's it's an old it's a view of history where you 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 try to examine as many sources as you can, and it's a it's a documentary appreciation. Um, I'm doing non-Indigenous people, so if I was doing Indigenous, this would not fly at all because oral, it's oral cultures, right? Um, up, up until quite recently, so I just did what I could, and um, I, I like these. I can't say I like Duncan Campbell Scott. He was one I really did not go for too much, but I tried my very best. I really did um, to try and say have some rounded picture of him. Um, he was a bureaucrat, an absolutely superb bureaucrat, and he just didn't see anything else except the ledger. The, the, he wasn't, he wasn't, um, but I mean, he had problems. I, I, I don't, that's not keep on him. I don't like emphasizing the negative. I tried to do, I tried to be fair to him from my vantage point, but the other side, it didn't, it like, I, I liked him very much. George Grant, let's take him, principal of Queens. Um, or president, I guess would be a modern term. He, uh, George Grant was fabulous. He did, you take a checklist of all the good things he did. He helped fund, uh, well, let's see now, women in Queens, good. Um, uh, African Canadian students, very positive. Um, defended the Chinese. Wow, late 19th century, that's extraordinary. And it's just the Jewish community was building a synagogue or perhaps a second one at this point. Anyways, he helped fund it. <laughs> he gave a donation. This is terrific, right? It just This is a poster boy for 21st century. But sorry, folks, this is the age. This is the mentality of the times. And there were no, it was, this was it. Assimilation or I guess now integration or, or cultural assimilation. Cultural, yeah, uh, cultural genocide is some yeah. use. This is the way it is now. Regarded, it's regarded like this. But come on, give these people a break. Take it in their own times. These were progressives. They wanted the First Nations to get schooling, and all. And this is where George Grant, by our standards today, which are not to be applied by my principle. You know, we don't try to we try to see it in the eyes of the present, uh, uh, the eyes of the times, not those of the present. Well, George Grant, <laughs> sorry, folks. He supported, promoted residential schools. <laughs> so too bad. But that you have to, I, I try, I don't condemn them. I try to explain it. And uh, there just weren't, it was the mentality of the age. Look at the the immigrants to Canada of non, non British background. They had English and uh, they, that was it. Uh, it was, I, I mean, it was just a, a similar approach. And, 
it, we, we can lament this and we should. And uh, we certainly would never push this again. But in the context of the times, this is the British Empire. This is the finest, the largest empire the world's ever seen. Yeah. And it, it just was the way. This was it. This was a gift. I was going to say, and it was that mentality of colonization and uh, expansion of the British ideal that everything else fell into tow with that from the mentality of the time. Absolutely. Well said. Yeah. Now, the um, was there anything in, in Seen But Not Seen that was an eye opener for you was a revelation in terms of of uh you know colonial and indigenous uh, uh relationships um uh, how people either negatively or positively interacted that surprised you well a lot of it of course was not surprising because you sort of have that stereotype you walk into they're going to be pretty narrow-minded but uh, sir john for example has got some great moments and one of them is about the credit Honestly, this is really outstanding. You know, unfortunately, when I give talks at Western Canada, it doesn't have the resonance that it will this afternoon with you, Matthew. But it's 1856, and John A., they're interpreting the, one of the treaties and the credit. And it's, um, it's a, it, it, John A. MacDonald says, no, you can't just sell this land. Uh, I'm sorry, it's in the book. I, I, I feel about it uncomfortable, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm saying this from memory, and that's always dangerous. Always dangerous. <laughs> Look at it, because that's, that's your business stuff. That's, that's something in the, the, you can use out of the shop. Yeah. It's 1856, and it's, um, he, he, he explains that he's a lawyer, and he was a good lawyer. He explains, this: you can't just sell this land. This is a trust agreement. This is the first recognition of an Indian trust. I'm sorry, I, I checked this out with uh, um, the new credit uh, law, lawyer, Kim Fullerton, and um, I credit him, of course. And, and he's confirmed, yes, this is good. And uh, so Johnny McDonald actually defends the credit people. So I thought that was amazing. Now, I knew that he was a friend of Peter Jones's son, Dr. Peter E. Jones, and that was something else. And um, yeah, there's another one I like about it. Uh, so John, let's stay with John A, because he's the big story here. And because it, it ties in with the credit, um, he, um, well, yeah. So he was, he, he really was an assimilate. I mean, he was assimilationist because he believed fully in the, the, the ideals of it. And it was a progressive move. It was helping the group move up and all, and this kind of thing. This is his outlook. And um, well, he um, wanted very much for the First Nations who were educated to be enfranchised. And franchise means freed of the Indian Act, become citizens, cease to be members of the communities. They had no rights in them. They become citizens of Canada, much better. They become members of the British Empire. It was terrific. It was a process. And uh, so he, he was the one that brought in the legislation, actually, and um, universally accepted by the others, the other legislatures, by the way. This was a common wisdom of the day. So his big disappointment, though, was Peter Jones's third son, Peter Edmund Jones, of whom there's an excellent biography by Alan Sherman. Anyways, Peter E. Jones became a medical doctor. He was uh, graduated from Queens. And um, he also, but he went back to his community and actually he served as chief at one point. And uh, also he's the medical officer at one point too. So here obviously is someone that Dr. Uh, that Johnny McDonald, I mean, this guy's got an franchise, right? I mean, it's just a natural, he's educated. He's all, all set to go to join the larger society. No, he wouldn't. He refused. I, a classic example of the, 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 the strength, the robust nature of the, of the First Nations cultures. No way. And so, but John A., here's, what, here's how he works through that. Okay, he thinks, and I've got this in the book, he's thinking of his Scottish relatives and uh, the Highlanders. Uh, they're just I'm not going to go for it, <laughs> slipping into the English society. And he says this in Parliament. So I can understand this. So when, what we'll do is we will let them, we will, these people who are met the standards that own property, that's very important, own property. You know, this is the whole key detail. And English or French, they've got mastery of those two languages. Uh, well, they can get the vote. They don't have to leave, give up their Indian status. That's his, his, his idea in 1885. Um, and so Gosh, I mean, Peter Edmund Jones, he's delighted and supports it fully, as do a number of other First Nations. But now, we just have to sidestep here. Don't ever, ever treat the Indigenous people as one. 
because there are all kinds of varieties of opinions. And after 50 years, do I ever know that? What I like best is a sense of humor, actually. But there always, there's always differences. So the Anishinaabeg or Ojibwe, they like this. And they, like Peter Edmund Jones, he loves this, he endorses the franchise, getting the vote, and but not having to give up Indian status, he endorses it, so do others. And uh, But the Iroquois or Haudenosaunee, large numbers of them do not. And they, they, they say, we are allies of the British crown. Why should we become subjects? And they don't. So it's, again, it's just so, please folks, take a break. Um, this is not something you can decide in an afternoon. This is a very complex issue. And, and um, so I, I hope I suggest the complexity in the book. Yeah. Uh, there are no easy answers. And um, if anyone has one, watch out. That's, 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 what, I, I, that's what I say categorically. And uh, fortunately for me, you see, I end my intensive study in the late 1960s because I, the present is so, ah, I, I, one scholar, um, Alan Cairn said, distinguished Canadian political scientist in the year 2000 said, you cannot keep up with this literature on Indigenous Canada, it's impossible. So, um, so that, that, that's basically it. And, and it was a surprise then, so John actually is surprising. And as regards to the big question, what about me? Yeah. How did I? Well, I, 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 I really, I sort of knew, but I never knew the intensity of this desire to say the First Nations would be themselves. Really, I mean that sounds so naive. Here, a professor, thirty-five years, University of Calgary. I certainly knew it. Out west, it's so strong. But at the same time, the intensity of it, going back into the past, that that was a dis that was a discovery. And there are others too. Um, some people I didn't have my when I'm doing the study of uh, some folks, I was, wasn't expecting some, some discoveries. They, they're human beings. There were strengths and weaknesses. And that's it. Strengths and weaknesses. Well, and I, all... I think what's amazing is, is just from your own words here today, uh, you know, when you started out, like you said, 50 years ago, um, uh, exploring, you know, the, the journals of, of, uh, of Reverend Peter Jones, um, and, and not having any background in this, in your own early education, um, to, as you said, not being able to keep up with the literature. I mean, you have seen uh, uh, such a transition and, a, and an about face on Indigenous culture in terms of its uh, mainstream awareness or mainstream interest, I guess, would, would be a, a, a good uh, explanation of it. Um, you must shake your head a little bit and, and, uh, and, and just, you know, the vastness of the, of the conversation now at a time when you were probably working in a vacuum 50 years ago. And, and uh, you know, you, you were one of those people that started the ball rolling on the interest. And whether you look at it that way or not, I think I'm, I'm very safe to say that. But, but to see where it is now, it must be quite a revelation for you. Oh, Matthew, I just discovered this word. A friend used it. And I, I certainly felt the resonance of it. A relic. I feel like a relic. I really do. I belong to a different era and I'm proud of it. Yeah. How do you like that? I, I, I congratulate you for that. And I'm, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> Gladiator speaks back. <laughs> I think being a relic is an advantage because we, the complexity of it, I know it so well and uh, simplistic answers and um, quick fixes, forget it. It's just, this is this, and this, I am delighted. This attention, my gosh, those territorial acknowledgements. Wow. <laughs> you know, Matthew, even 10 years ago. Absolutely. You... Absolutely. I mean, th this whole, uh, in the last 10 years is, you know, I've seen it uh, 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 yeah. expand exponentially in terms of the interest and awareness. And... Yeah. And, 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 and yet, you know, that's great, but there are problems here. I mean, like, we've got different First Nations groups with different ideas of their history and stuff. I mean, it's very complex and that's what I love it. Give me complexity. Well, I get that way. I think some young people, they get, they sell themselves short because they go for some simplistic formula or something, but wow, just get into it. So integrated, so rich and the languages. Oh man, I never got very far. I told you that, right? It took two winters of it, but boy, I learned about insights that I never get otherwise. Yeah. And the importance of those languages and, and, and just, but now so many, there's, it's just, it's, just, it's so encouraging because I'm sorry, I'm very positive. That's, see, it, it, I, that's why I have my first chapter. I, I do a lot of personal on that. It's called the prologue. Yeah. I do a lot of personal because it's only fair. Who yeah. is this guy? 
I mean, who's well, who's the big guru? Is he the big guru? Well, he isn't. And I got, and so I, I I'm quite clean. I came from out of a bubble. Oakville, Ontario? You gotta be kidding. <laughs> Realities of life. <laughs> and uh, ever since then, it's been a discovery of a different world. <laughs> so, it, it, and, and poor credit to Mrs. Sog. I mean, we're all the same, basically. It's just a very comfortable section of Ontario um, oh, and Burlington. This, and oh, well, I'm just saying that I'm a child of the privilege. And I know that. And um, I'm grateful for it. Well, perhaps, I mean, that, that might be a good way for us to, to jump off and, and uh, to say thank you, to recommend, you know, highly, uh, not only the first two books that we talked about, Sacred Feathers and, and Miss Sucker Portraits, but the new book, Seen But Not Seen. And, uh, you know, this triumvirate of your work in terms of the of, uh, Indigenous history, uh, um, I don't know if that's the right term to use, but uh, I, I do feel that they go together very strongly um, and, and are a really good uh, eye-opener uh, exploration of a people, their story, and the times in which they lived and, and, and how that uh, influenced them and our own ideas of what Indigenous culture is, 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 is quite, quite telling. And you've helped, you've helped to peel the, 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 the shutters open, if you will, uh, over your career and uh, uh, offer us a glimpse into the story of a people that largely were not recorded and not seen. I guess that's a segue in your book, seen but not seen. Um, and uh, I compliment you for that. It, it, they are phenomenal and I cannot recommend them uh, any higher. And I look forward to finishing uh, Seen But Not Seen. I haven't finished it yet, but uh, your writings as always are fascinating. Matthew, can I just say one more thing? Absolutely. Please, please judge me not, like I'm not writing about indigenous people. I'm writing about images of indigenous people. I'm writing about us non-Indigenous Canadians, yep. that's why I want to be judged because <laughs> I'm my respect for these cultures is so great, especially taking the language course. I mean, my goodness, holy jeepers. Uh, it, it, it's, it's about non-Indigenous world and how we got it wrong. It, it's a book I often think, and this, is, this will be my last tidbit here, um, John F. Kennedy, uh, President of the United States, of course, very, you know, assassination in 63 and all it was just terrible but when he was a, a young man he wrote a book uh it was about england and appeasement about europe in, in the beginning of world war ii and the title of the book was why england slept now taking it my book seen but not seen why were we so unconscious of this why didn't we know why wouldn't we see it why did we not see that's what i'm after that's what I'm up about. And others, come on, get in, join the team. I was going to say, why, why did we not see or why did we choose not to see? I mean, right? That's the... Absolutely. And the cover is so great because Trudeau and Christian are looking at each other. They're not right. looking at uh, the president of the National Indian Brotherhood, Dieter. I was just, the, the picture of the cover has so many unspoken words you can put in their mouths. It's kind of... <laughs> But, uh, you know, I, I, I just, I, I compliment you on that and, and this, and, you know, a book like this at this time, I mean, perhaps it would have been welcome at any time, but at this time really is the idea of starting to see, um, mm -hmm. uh, of, of, you know, realizing that we've ignored this for so very much too long. Um, and, and, you know, in part, we, we all heard about the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and, and, and the work of they're doing, but this is really a, a work that you've put together that brings the story to life in the context of the times in which it happened, right up to the modern era. I mean, I know you said you take it into the 1960s, but then in, in your epilogue and, and so on, I, I know you bring it up into up to the modern era, even if we, we can't keep track of all the stuff that comes out now. But, but you know, this is something, that we, these are people that we know, these are people that we've heard of, and, and, and why have we not heard of the other material during their time is, uh, is quite a, a neat exploration that you've, you've, you've traveled, you've given us. Thank you very much. It's been well, a pleasure. Well, thank you so much. I, I wish you the best of health. Um, and uh, hopefully Calgary keeps you, keeps you well and keeps you warm in the summer months ahead. And uh, uh, I appreciate you, and particularly during these days of COVID. Uh, I know there are challenges all around. And uh, so all the best to you. And uh, thank you for spending some time with us here. Thank you, Matthew. 
Thank you for spending some time with us here at Ask a Historian. And a special thank you to Professor Emeritus Donald Smith from the University of Calgary for spending the time with us to explore his life and his works around Indigenous history and his writings on the Mississaugas of the Credit River, and particularly his focus on his new book, Seen But Not Seen. And we look forward to future episodes of Ask a Historian as we explore fascinating connections to our local history here in Mississauga.